Hi, and welcome to this tutorial on the EHFE conference in 2020. Um, I am Don Huismans from the Technical University of Delft, and I'll be hosting this uh, tutorial today. Um, the tutorial is about one-dimensional to four-dimensional anthropometry with the Dynet platform. Um, so the tutorial is divided in a number of parts and it will roughly take about uh, two hours in total. Um, so let me quickly introduce the different parts and then I'll introduce myself and um, if the, the, the live streaming allows, you can also, uh, as an audience, introduce yourselves. So the two hour tutorial is divided into four parts. The first part will be about one-dimensional and two-dimensional anthropometry, what we call um, traditional anthropometry. Um, the second part will be about three-dimensional anthropometry, and it is also uh, the main focus of this uh, tutorial, and that will also be the longest part of about 45 minutes. So there we will talk about 3D scanning, the necessary steps uh, that are needed in order to create statistical shape models and to do 3D anthropometry and of course we will introduce some cases. Um, <clears throat> and after giving, let's say, the theory of 3D anthropometry, uh, we move on and uh, have a hands-on um, lecture with 3D anthropometry. So I will introduce some tools and techniques uh, so that you, uh, for your own project, can do 3D anthropometry uh, without um, yeah, hiring an engineer or without having to buy expensive software. Um, and then finally, I will conclude the workshop or the tutorial uh, with a, a quick view to the future and with some examples of four-dimensional anthropometry. So um, yeah, let me quickly introduce myself. So I'm Tom Huismans. Um, I have a background in computer science uh, from the University of Antwerp in, um, in Belgium. Uh, I also did my PhD there. Uh, it was around uh, 2004 that I started and I did research on uh, shape correspondence and modeling. Um, so fundamental techniques that enable us to analyze 3D scan databases. Um, and then uh, after that, as a postdoc, I uh, applied the technique that I developed in various fields like orthopedics and product development. And then I became um, a research leader uh, in Antwerp. Um, I built out a group of about five people um, and some of them are still uh, there. Um, and we did a lot of projects with, with industry also um, around uh, anthropometry and 3D anthropometry. Um, <clears throat> then in 2018, I moved to Delft. Um, there. I am within the Faculty of Industrial Design Engineering, um, the Department of Human-Centered Design, and within the section of Applied Ergonomics and Design. And there I am an assistant professor in um, ergonomics and focusing on digital human modeling. So at the bottom you can see my contact details uh, right about here. So feel free to get into contact uh, after the workshop. Um, Okay, so now I would like to have some, uh, some time or leave some time for um, the audience to introduce themselves. So maybe you know, you, we can do a quick round, um, either live or either in the chat box and, and just let me know what, uh, what is your background, where, from which uh, company or university are you and what, uh, yeah, what would you hope to learn in this tutorial. Okay. Thanks. This was the introduction. Let's uh, start with one-dimensional and two-dimensional traditional anthropometry. So I'll start with a bit of an introduction to anthropometry. Um, I'm certainly not an expert in the history of anthropometry, but I'll try to give you some idea. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, anthropometry, it's a form of uh, you know, physical anthropology. Uh, it literally means uh, the measurement of men um, and, and the description that basically it's the science that uh, describes the human body dimensions and its variations through statistics. Um, and typically uh, we think about um, weight, length, stature, for example, uh, volumes. Um, 
And this is often reported with respect to certain categories, uh, like a certain age range or differences between gender or, or birth. Um, and Gaussian distributions are, are commonly used here. Um, and, and that is why we often report uh, a specific anthropometric uh, measure as uh, a certain average with a standard deviation. And then from this average and standard deviation, um, here is a visualization of the amount of, um, yeah, the amount of, uh, of the proportion of the population that is uh, within one standard deviation from mean here, that's about 34%. So if you say the mean plus minus one standard deviation is about 70% uh, of people uh, fall within that. And you can add standard deviations um, to indicate a larger um, range of, of subjects. Um, the anthropometry um, was, to my knowledge, founded by the Belgian uh, person Adolphe Kittelet. Um, and he was also the person that invented the, the body mass index. Uh, uh, so your weight in kilograms divided by um, the length in meters squared. So it gives you an idea of uh, the body proportion. Um, and of course, today it, it, it may already have, uh, um, yeah, it's already outdated. Um, and um, yeah, there's a range of applications uh, for anthropometry. Um, yeah, this can be uh, for the identification purposes. So biometrics, like uh, fingerprint recognition, it's, it's a form of anthropometry, um, or facial recognition, um, but also for forensics, uh, because certain proportions might um, yeah, tell you something about the species that you have found bones from, um, and so on. Um, uh, other applications are uh, industrial design. Um, yeah, my, my background uh, is uh, industrial design, so this is uh, also the main focus within the, uh, within the tutorial. Um, and so, for example, for clothing design, anthropometry is very useful uh, for setting up sizing systems. Um, for product ergonomics, uh, ensuring that a product fits well to the human body and therefore is comfortable and functions well uh, and is safe to use. Um, so there it is also used and in architecture, for example, for yeah, sizing um, like doors and staircases. Um, that's what it's also um, used for. Um, yeah, here you can see an example, a typical example of traditional anthropometry. Uh, and, and its use. So you have a, a, a workstation here, um, computer workstation, and, and there is a desk chair, uh, and there is a desk, and there are different heights and depths related to those products. But there are also yeah, different body uh, types uh, and different body sizes and proportions that can uh, sit at this desk and chair. Uh, and so the body proportions and uh, the product proportions, they need to be matched uh, up so that you get a comfortable and um, um, yeah, economic um, work situation. And yeah, what you then see is that there are uh, a variety of body measurements defined, um, and then these are reported uh, in percentiles. And for example, if you say for stature, the fifth percentile is uh, yeah, one meter 70, then this means that 5% of people is still smaller than that. The 50th percentile is the average, or, or um, in case of a Gaussian distribution at least, and the 95th percentile um, yeah, it means that still 5% of people are larger than uh, one meter and 90 centimeters. Um, but this information, and then specifically for the desk chair, it's interesting to know what is the, the yeah, what does the adjustment of the seat height need to be? And you can put that in relation to the popliteal height, uh, so the, the lower leg length, and then including also the shoes. And then you can look up what is the uh, lower leg length and then uh, find out what the range is. And then this gives you an, uh, ident um, an idea of uh, what the range for the seat adjustment should be. So this is a typical example of traditional anthropometry. Um, 
and how it can be used. Another example, um, classic example, is garments. In this case, for example, a t-shirt. Um, and then the t-shirt is made out of flat pieces uh, of textile, which are sewn together. Um, and then there's the, uh, the body, which is uh, not flat, but has a, a three-dimensional curved shape. Uh, and then you may need to make sure that one fits onto the other. Um, and therefore, yeah, people started measuring circumferences and lengths, so like the bust circumference, uh, waist and hip circumference. Um, and this information is then used to size the, uh, the panels. So uh, if you want to make sure that the T-shirt fits, the circumference uh, uh, or two times the width of the T-shirt needs to be larger than the circumference uh, at the bust here. And of course, you need to give some additional space to make sure that it's comfortable to wear and that you can still move. And then, yeah, you can set up sizing systems uh, based on the distributions of the body proportions and body sizes, you can make a small, medium, large, for example. And what we recently see is that, um, um, yeah, we are not all the same body uh, size, but also we have different body shapes. Um, and then you can have, uh, yeah, different kinds of smalls and medium and large. You could have, could have, for example, a small, but for a tall person. So the, the person is skinny, but still uh, large. Um, so yeah, you can get, get these combined um, uh, sizes also. Um, and here, this is an illustration of, yeah, let's say a first indication that traditional anthropometry does not tell the full story. So here you have three subjects and I yeah, calculated the waist circumference um, and uh, yeah, it's a 2D section in this case and I've overlaid them here on the right of the screen. And then you can see that uh, indeed the circumference increases but also the shape changes and it changes dramatically. Um, so these uh, numbers which would typically be reported with traditional anthropometry do not tell you anything about the shape. And that's an important insight uh, because that is uh, in the next parts of the tutorial, uh, the lead up to use 3D anthropometry, of course. And this is important. Eh? If you want to design a t-shirt, for example, then in this case, the green case, the front and the back panel would be approximately the same uh, length, while in the blue case, the front panel would probably be much larger than the black. Uh, back panel in order to have a, a nicely fitting uh, t-shirt. <clears throat> um, and in industry there is also the recognition that there are multiple body types and for example the jeans industry um, has uh, yeah, used their marketing to, uh, yeah, to, to communicate that they also um, have solutions for different body shapes or that they uh, take this into account. Uh, so there's a uh, not people who are more skinny and straight uh, body type to yeah, more boldly curved um, body shapes and then they design jeans that, um, yeah, that fit nicely for those body types. So that's a nice evolution. So, well, um, it comes down to the following. Um, anthropometric knowledge um, is, uh, is important uh, and can significantly reduce the number of iterations in the design process um, because you can yeah, start early um, with the right uh, knowledge about what the expected range of body sizes and shapes is um, and then early in the product development process you can take that into account and then of course after you're still going to do user tests with the product and you will find new uh, issues that you have to address um, but at least you have addressed as much as you can based on available anthropometric knowledge. Um, so by reducing the number of iterations, you also reduce the costs of the product development process and make it possible to yeah, relatively quickly create uh, products and new versions of a, a product. Uh, but of course, as I already said, there are limitations. So it's just a, a few measurements typically. Um, it does not regard the complete body shape it largely disregards uh, the shape. And very often uh, in these anthropometric tables, we, we just have uh, a statistical summarization of uh, one um, measure after the other and not the relation between the measures. 
And of course, there is a lot of correlation between body dimensions, and that is often not available with these traditional anthropometric tables. Um, so then we come to our platform, our Dynet platform. So it's a platform that was initiated about 40 years ago by uh, my predecessor, Johan Molenbroek, uh, at the TU Delft. Um, and he set this up in the beginning as a paper tool. Um, and this slowly evolved, uh, evolved into a computer software. And, and now it is a, a website, an interactive website. And basically, it has uh, one dimensional uh, data behind the scenes. So it's a database with measurements uh, for different uh, body dimensions for different target groups, uh, different countries also. Um, and there are different tools that work uh, with this one dimensional data. And recently we have also added three dimensional data, but I will come back to that later, so not at this uh, point. Um, and with this one dimensional data, you can do interesting things. So first of all, you can use the one dimensional database uh, to report summary statistics, so average percentiles, etc., cetera, uh, standard deviations. Uh, from individual measurements. Uh, and you can also combine different groups um, or compare different target populations and see how they compare uh, uh, regarding uh, the different measurements that you're interested in. Uh, then there is uh, the uh, profiler. Um, the profiler is uh, an interesting tool to see um, if you have, for example, uh, design a lot with yourself as a reference um, then it is good to know where you fit in the population. And this profiler allows you to enter your personal measurements and then it, it tells you where you fit in a, in a certain target population that you select. And I can advise you to try this out um, yourself and you will see that you're not um, average. So people can think, well, I'm kind of average. Uh, um, but you will see that uh, there might be a few uh, measurements for which you are average, but then there is always extremes to the large and to the and to the small side, um, so that is interesting to know if you're designing a lot with yourself uh, as a reference. But also, if you're designing for um, uh, with a kind of a test panel, then it is good to set the test panel uh, in the profiler, yeah? and you can have different people uh, in the profiler, so you get different uh, different curves here, um, and then you can see for each test subject, uh, yeah, where are they smaller or larger with respect to the other test subjects. And that uh, yeah, might help you in uh, explaining certain observations when the user panel starts using your product. Uh, then we have the ellipse tool. Uh, this is basically a tool um, where you can create scatter plots, scatter plots of two dimensions that you choose. Uh, you can, for example, plot body weight versus body height uh, or stature. Um, and then what you often see is that there is a correlation um, and the correlation is also reported on. Um, but the nice thing of this uh, ellipse tool is that indeed you can uh, identify these correlations, um, but then you can uh, start using this data interactively. So you can start drawing boxes on top of this uh, plot. Um, and these boxes, they can represent sizes, uh, product sizes. Um, and then the, the people that are within the box, so each point here is one subject, uh, those are the subjects that you would assign to, to this product size. Um, and I'll give an example uh, in a few minutes about this. Uh, it allows you to um, yeah, set up sizing systems and to know beforehand um, yeah, how many people you will be able to cover with each size. And also, if you have an existing sizing system, you can put it in here and evaluate um, yeah, whether this, um, the sizing has been done well, um, because there might be the case that, that yeah, you cover part of the population and a certain part does not uh, get covered by any of the sizes. So that, is, that might uh, yeah, be a problem there. And then there is uh, the last part, the reach envelopes. Um, yeah, this is basically, um, yeah, it, it, it was some, some uh, time ago that uh, experiments were done um, uh, with the number of subjects on yeah, how far they can reach with their arms in, in, uh, in two directions. And you can, um, yeah, you can use this, for example, to, uh, to design a, a bathroom, maybe, 
um, to make sure that everything is uh, within reach um, or a console. Uh, yeah. So now I would like to uh, yeah, give you a quick um, Oops. There we go. So this is a quick uh, demonstration of the Dynet platform. Um, so of course, yeah, you have to create an account. And then uh, once you create an account, you have to acknowledge the account and then sign in. Um, so it, it works with your email address. And from that point on, you have access to everything in the database. Um, so the the Dynet platform is open, so it's free for uh, commercial and for research use. Um, and then, yeah, let's start with the one-dimensional database. So here you can uh, click uh, on the menu bar uh, with, uh, where the tools are listed. And then you can see that the population is selected, touch adults in this case, and then males between 65 and 80. So elderly people are selected. And then the stature is selected. And then you can see here at the bottom, um, yeah, the, the amount of uh, millimeters the stature is for the average and what the standard deviation is. And here you can uh, set percentiles. So two and a half percentile, for example. Now we're going to 97 and a half percentile. And that is in this case, it's 1854 millimeters. So that's a way to get insight into one dimensional measurements. The ellipse tool, um, is a tool that yeah, allows creating sizing systems and revealing correlations. Um, so yeah, you start by selecting a population, in this case, touch adults, males between 19 and 36. And then we have sitting height and elbow height. Um, and uh, these are our two uh, axes. And then we can add uh, boxes, which could be sizes. Um, in this case, it is for um, a chair, for example. Um, so this could be then the, the small chair. This is just a quick example. And then the large chair. And you can see that it covers a certain a part in popliteal height, but uh, the full range in, um, in elbow height. So we have two sizes, small and large. And the nice thing is that it shows also the percentage of the population that is covered by each size. So that's ellipse. This is the profiler. So that's the tool that shows um, yeah, the percentages of an individual within a target population. So either it being yourself or uh, some uh, user panel that you're uh, working with. So here we can take touch adults, uh, middle aged range, and now we are adding a few measurements. So we have stature as a measurement and then body mass, and then I'm roughly entering my own values here. So one meter 84, and about 60 kilograms. And you can see that I'm not average, quite long, quite high, but uh, low body mass. And you will see that's for yeah, everybody, a different situation. And the main message is nobody is average. Um, don't use averages, use our platform get more information about the distribution of certain measurements. Okay. So this is a, an example case, the desk chair. Um, and this is a case that we use in the classroom. So here you have, uh, well, it, this is not the desk chairs, this is exam chairs. So we have a, a number of chairs uh, available for different students. Uh, they come in different sizes, um, as do the students. Um, and then the idea is yeah, how, how many uh, desk chairs do you have to purchase or how many sizes do you need to have to cover the whole population of students. So there are two product uh, dimensions uh, in the exam chairs, uh, important dimensions, and that is the, the seat depth. So that is the distance um, um, yeah, from the front to the back of the seat and the seat height. So that is basically the height of the seat pad. And corresponding with that are two body dimensions. So for the seat depth, we have the, um, the sitting depth, and that is the, the distance between uh, the popliteal and the buttock. 
And on the other hand, you have the popliteal height, which corresponds to the seat height. So that's basically the length of the lower leg, added to that the height of the shoe. And now we can create um, with our DNet tool, and this is an old picture, but you can uh, use the, the DNet tool uh, for that still, um, to plot the population. So here we plotted uh, the student population. Um, so Dutch uh, students, uh, which we measured, and we measured their popliteal height, so the lower leg length, um, and also their, um, their sitting depth, or the, the buttock popliteal depth. Um, and they are plotted here on both axes. And now we have uh, small, medium, large, and extra large chairs. Um, and for example, for the medium seat, we have a seat height that is 455 millimeters and a seat depth that is uh, 355 millimeters. Um, but of course, you do not have to have um, an exact popliteal height of 455 and an exact um, buttock popliteal depth of 355 to fit the chair. Um, so actually, uh, when you're sitting on the chair, you want to have some room between the back of the chair and um, on the back of your buttocks. Um, and you also want to have a little bit of space uh, uh, in the knee crease. Um, on the other hand, you want, uh, of course, you want to be able to touch your feet on the floor. But if you have some, uh, yeah, if you have a chair that is a little bit smaller than your uh, leg length, uh, including the new shoes, then you can still uh, angle your, uh, your lower legs a bit forward. And we took here about 30 degrees as a maximum. Um, and by taking this angling into account, you can yeah, create a kind of range of people that fit uh, this uh, seat height. Um, and then, of course, um, yeah, it, it, regarding the seat depth, um, so you need to have some space uh, uh, at the knee crease, um, and you can have a bit extra space without it being uh, uncomfortable. So that is why uh, these three sizes are, uh, they start from the seat height and seat depth, but then they are increased uh, in range to take into account the fact that um, yeah, you can angle your legs to accommodate the chair, um, or you can sit a bit forward or backward to accommodate a larger uh, or smaller seat pad. But what you can see here is that, for example, for the small chair and for our Dutch population, practically nobody is, um, yeah, is uh, fitting that chair. The large, extra large and medium, they do have coverage and they have a little bit of overlap, which is not a problem. Um, but as you can see here, there is about 13% uh, of the population, people with uh, yeah, relatively long legs, um, but uh, long lower legs, but uh, shorter uh, upper legs, uh, which are not covered by any of the chairs. So that, yeah, you could um, improve this sizing system by taking this distribution of, um, of, uh, of sizes into account uh, before you create a sizing system. And yeah, maybe you can create an additional size here to cover that um, area. Or you could, um, yeah, lower the extra large and large in size. So you lower them a bit um, so that it matches better with our population. So that's an example of the ellipse. Uh, an example of how you can use our DNet platform um, for looking at a sizing system, uh, to evaluate the sizing system, and to come up with new sizes. Um, then, yeah, I would like to talk about um, future uh, inclusion in DNet regarding traditional anthropometry, and that is the uh, multivariate anthropometry. So, um, the ellipse tool is nice, it, it allows you to plot one measurement versus another, but often if you're designing a product, then you have to take into account much more measurements. Uh, and so usually there's more than two measurements available, um, and you cannot capture with, with uh, one dimensional or with correlation analysis. Um, you cannot capture all the correlations um, easily. Uh, and that's where multivariate anthropometry comes in. So it uh, typically, it captures the 
um, tries to capture most of the variation with just a few uh, variables. And these are yeah, new variables that are introduced by the uh, technique. So it, it typically uses uh, principal component analysis. Uh, and principal component analysis is a dimensionality reduction tool that can be used uh, to reduce a large set of variables, uh, for example, body measurements, into a small set, but that still contains most of the information of the large set. So here is an example of how that would look like. So you have your subject features. Uh, in this case, it's a number of features on the head. So you have the uh, zygomatic breadth, the length of the face, uh, the breadth of the head, the circumference, and, and so on. So you have a number of dimensions. Um, and what you're now doing is um, you're plotting these dimensions, um, putting one dimension on each axis. So you get a bunch of axes, uh, let's say a, a 10 dimensional space here. And for each of your subjects, you place uh, a point in that space, uh, given these coordinates. And then you end up with some kind of cloud in this high dimensional space. Uh, but you will see that this cloud has a certain shape. So there is a lot of correlations. For example, face length and head breadth. Yeah, if a head grows in size, then both of them increase. So there is typically a, a, a large correlation there. And this is also with other measurements. Um, so what you typically see is that uh, within this um, space of measures, uh, anthropometric measures, uh, there are some trends to be spotted. Um, and what principal component analysis does, it uh, first calculates the average uh, in this high dimensional space, and then it looks at the uh, main uh, direction within this cloud. So it looks basically at the longest axis um, of this cloud. Um, and then it describes this yeah, direction, this longest direction of the cloud with a new parameter, with a new axis, and that's the first principal component. And then perpendicular to that, you can do the same thing. And perpendicular to that, the space has been reduced with one dimension, so you still have a number of dimensions left. And in that space, you can find, again, the direction of the largest uh, uh, correlation. And in that way, uh, you can come up, uh, and typically what you do here is, is two principal components. So uh, then you describe, uh, transform your data uh, into this new coordinate system with two principal components. Um, and then you plot your points here again. Um, and then you can use this space to create sizes. Uh, and the nice thing of this space is that, um, yeah, it, it contains, um, yeah, a lot of correlations between the different measurements. And you can take that with you uh, in the further analysis. If you look at biological specimens, what we often see is that the first principal component, uh, it encodes differences in size. And the second principal component, it usually uh, uh, expresses a, a length, width, or aspect ratio difference. So here we have uh, an example um, that we published some time ago, um, where we were looking at, um, yeah, an oxygenation mask for children. Here you can see uh, an example face, uh, and we yeah, have drawn here the region of interest on top of that. And then as a designer, you can investigate the product, you can look at the, the database, and then decide at some point that the most important dimensions um, are the distance between um, the cellium and the promentalis, so basically nose to the chin um, and the mouth width. So these are like the two main axes that um, yeah, you can use for determining a sizing system for your product. And that was, uh, was done here. So this is a bivariate distribution, basically a scatter pot could have been done with ellipse. And then we used some uh, clustering technique. So we uh, were pairing together all the faces which have similar shapes um, or similar mouth width and similar um, uh, face length. Um, and then you get, yeah, in this case, uh, four groups and uh, that was chosen beforehand. And then for each of these groups, uh, with some techniques that I'll discuss later on, with 3D anthropometry techniques, you can create uh, an average face. And you can do that for each group and then you get four 
uh, faces. And you can see that there are different lengths and different mouth widths um, within this uh, group or within this population. And these are then uh, a possible set of representative mannequins for designing your oxygenation mask. Um, we can do a similar thing with, um, um, but instead of working with the uh, original dimensions, we work with the principal components. So we take all the facial dimensions that we have in the database, and then we do the principal component analysis, and then describe our data uh, with the two most uh, prominent variations. Um, and in this case, it was, uh, yeah, if you look at the principal components here, all the lengths have positive factors. So that means that this is a scaling of the face. So the first direction is basically a scaling of the face. Uh, and the second direction here um, is a kind of aspect ratio. Uh, so you can see that for, for example, for face width, it has a positive um, factor, while for face length, it has a negative factor. So you get a, a difference in, um, in face width versus length. Um, now we also did clustering here, um, but yeah, in, in the end of the clustering, decided that uh, it was uh, most beneficial to create just uh, groups uh, along the first axis. Um, and that, that is what you see here. Um, so then you get uh, also four mannequins, but these are um, basically four different sizes. Um, and then it's a bit, a bit of a debate, uh, which is best. And in this case, I think the, um, uh, the multivariate might uh, might be an improvement because it takes into account, um, um, yeah, uh, when scaling a face, it takes into account also the, the correlations uh, with the uh, other facial dimensions. Um, and, and in this case, we also arrived at the conclusion that, yeah, the scale is the most important aspect here. Uh, but apart from the scale, um, yeah, you can see also that uh, each scale has a, a specific face shape that you can take into account. Okay, so thanks. That was the first part, 1D and 2D anthropometry. Um, and now we'll continue with 3D anthropometry. Okay, welcome back. Let's uh, continue with um, on the new part, in this case, 3D anthropometry. So 3D anthropometry, um, that's as it's in the name, um, it departs from the traditional way of uh, anthropometry where you work with measurements and it starts to use 3D information. Now, not all 3D anthropometry uh, uses um, surface scans or meshes or triangle surfaces um, as the data. Sometimes 3D anthropometry is also um, referred um, or also refers to uh, where you're working with 3D point uh, information like uh, yeah, you use a digitizer to collect the number of points on the body um, and you work with this 3D data uh, and try to yeah, summarize variations of these points. That is not the 3D anthropometry that I'm looking at here. So here we're going to look at 3D anthropometry which starts, basically anthropometry that starts from a database of surface scans. Um, so this session will take about 45 minutes um, and we will talk about uh, 3D scanning. So yeah, how can you collect scans? Uh, how can you collect data from your target population? Um, and then an important step before you can do statistics with uh, 3D scans is correspondence. Um, so, because 3D scans, they, yeah, they can have all kinds of artifacts and they, they can be messy collections of triangles. Um, to calculate, for example, an average, an average um, surface, uh, it's not uh, trivial. So you need to first take each scan and map that scan to each other scan so you can compare them. So that, that, that procedure is called correspondence. And then we will look into statistical shape modeling. So that's basically the equivalent uh, of the standard deviation and the average in one dimensional anthropometry. But then uh, for, uh, for 3D anthropometry, we call it statistical shape modeling. 
um, and it consists out of the average body shape and a number of body shape variations connected to that uh, also certain standard deviations. And then I will give some example cases. So let's jump into it. Um, so yeah, why, why 3D and topography? Um, you could ask. And here is a, an example of two uh, mannequins, uh, two design mannequins that are used in various sectors. So here you have the EN960 mannequin. It's used as a, a test mannequin for helmet, um, cycling helmets, for example, but it's also used in the design of them, uh, of um, these mannequins, uh, of these helmets. Um, and you can see here that uh, yeah, this has been built out of uh, uh, yeah, one-dimensional measurements. Um, um, and you can see that a lot of detail is missing here. This, on the other hand, is a similar mannequin, but it is built out of a database of 3D scans without uh, converting it into one-dimensional me measurements first, no, directly working with the 3D scans. And as a result, you can see that it's a much more natural shape um, and that it also has um, all the, yeah, the facial features that you would expect uh, such a mannequin to have. Here's another example. So this is a traditional full body mannequin that is created as a, a composition of uh, yeah, some cut primitives. Um, it was based on uh, measurements that were retrieved from the Dynet uh, platform, so one dimensional measurements, and sized accordingly. Um, so it, is, uh, it has the right body proportions uh, for a P50 mannequin, but what it misses here is the, yeah, the true to uh, the body shape. Um, it is missing the body shape detail and, and it, yeah, the shape is, is uh, as you can see, it is a cat primitive shape and not a real anatomical uh, even body shape. So this is what it looks like if you create a P50 mannequin out of 3D scans. Um, and these uh, two, uh, let's say, traditional mannequins, they certainly have their use, but specifically if you're going to work with the design of wearables like garments and headsets, helmets, gloves, shoes, etc., then, yeah, you would want to work with these full detail mannequins. Um, so, um, where you have in one dimensional anthropometry, you have the average and the standard deviation as a statistical summary. Uh, here you have the statistical model, statistical shape model as a summary. And what is, what is such a statistical shape model? It is a parametric virtual representation of the variation of the human characteristic based on a database of examples. And in this case, we focus on body shape. So it's a representation of body shape and its variation based on a database of examples. Um, and this is a, a quick outline of a process, uh, how we go from a target population, so a number of subjects, all the way to the statistical shape model, which captures the variation of the body with a mathematical model. So the first step is um, to digitize 3D scan your population subjects and then to apply a correspondence so that the data points, in this case, the 3D scans can be compared with each other. So they are converted into a structured representation. Um, and when you have this structured representation, you can do modeling. So you can apply statistical modeling algorithms and what comes out in the end is a statistical shape model. And what you can see here is a shape model of the head, where at the center you can see the average head and the color code. So blue means low variation and green means, green means uh, higher variation. Um, and along the diagonals, you can see the different principal components. So for example, along this diagonal, you can see that it morphs uh, from a female, small head, uh, over the average, all the way up to a large um, and typically male head. Um, and here's another variation uh, in the vertical direction. It is a more pointy face to a more uh, square face. Okay, these are a number of statistical human models that I built in the past. So you, you can work with body scans, but you can also look inside the body and build models from that. So here you have, for example, 
statistical model of bone. So these are the three legs in, um, or the three bones in your leg. Uh, femur, tibia, and fibula. And this was built uh, from about 200 patients. Here you can see a clavicle, average clavicle, with the variation indicated with the color map. It was based around 50 subjects. This was based around uh, 100 subjects, I believe, and these were um, middle ear bones. So incus and malleus in this case. This is the nasal cavity, so basically the air inside your nose, so the air pocket in, inside your nose. Um, yeah, we also model that. This is an average about, of about 50 subjects. Here we have a full body average uh, of Dutch uh, males, uh, or Dutch uh, males and females, about 1,000 subjects. Here you have a statistical shade model of uh, hands and wrists of about 200 subjects. This is a statistical shape model of the ear, which we did for Philips. It's uh, 150 subjects. And here we have a statistical shape model of the head, specifically of the outer surface. But also we have one data set where we included the skull. So we get also an idea of the soft tissue thickness. It's about 100 subjects. And here we have models of the foot. This was about 400 subjects. So various models. Uh, statistical models uh, that capture the human body variation um, in all its forms and different parts of the human body and you can use this in, um, yeah, in design to create design mannequins, to create virtual subjects to test your product virtually or to make 3D prints uh, and do some physical tests um, with your product in the 3D print before you start testing with subject. Okay. So moving on to 3D scanning, I will move a little bit quicker here because it's not the main focus uh, of, the, of today. Um, but it's nice to have an idea of the different scanning technologies out there. So this is a, an overview of different technologies. So it's a taxonomy of uh, the different scanning techniques. Uh, and on the top, you have yeah, either contact techniques, like for example, a tape measure, you make contact with the subject and non-contact techniques. And so these are typically imaging techniques, which um, yeah, use camera sensors to create um, 3D uh, images. And then you have uh, passive and active techniques. And passive techniques, they just look at the scene and try to use the information that's there to do the reconstruction. Uh, and active techniques, they usually project some additional um, light into the scene, and they look at how this light behaves um, yeah, how it, uh, yeah, how the, for example, how the pattern is being deformed when it is projected. And from that, it tries to learn uh, what the shape of the object is. Then you have transmissive and reflective. Um, in reflective, yeah, this is basically things that are reflected back, uh, like visible light. Um, it's reflected back, and then you image this and do the reconstruction. While uh, with transmissive, uh, techniques, you basically, the, the light goes through um, the subject and you capture what is left of the light. And then you use that information to create a 3D reconstruction. And of course, at the bottom, there's a number of, of techniques. Um, so I'll pick out a few of these and talk about yeah, positive and negative points. A digitizer. Many of you might know this. I think this is also already around for a long time. So this is a digitizer. Basically, it's a robot arm um, which you can articulate, and there is a pen attached to it. And the computer can calculate back from the angles of the uh, arm where your pen point is uh, positioned at. And then you can do a 3D registration, uh, a 3D reconstruction. The drawback, uh, or the benefit is that it's quite accurate, um, but the drawback is that it, yeah, you just collect point data, so not complete surfaces, or it takes you a lot of time to, come, to put many points on the surface. Um, yeah, these are uh, another kind of techniques. Actually, all the, the next techniques are non-contact techniques because these are the most interesting ones, starting with active techniques. So these are techniques that put uh, project light into the scene and look at the light and do the reconstruction from that. So here we have um, 
traditional laser scanning. So you have a calibrated camera and laser projector pair. Um, and the laser uh, projector, it creates a laser plane. And whenever an object intersects this laser plane, uh, yeah, you get an illumination. So typically you get a stripe um, across the object. And then by looking at this from the camera, you get a kind of shaped stripe. And since you know the position and orientation of the camera with respect to the plane, you can, um, uh, for each of these points, derive what the distance is between P, small p, and large p. So you can basically reconstruct this line in 3D. And then you sweep your line over the object and you get all kinds of sections and you superimpose these sections in order to get um, one view of the, of the object. Of course, um, the drawback is that when the subject moves, um, the, the different sections are not consistent with each other. Um, so that's why, um, yeah, other techniques were introduced. Do you, for example, have the um, structured light projection? And the structured light projection, it basically projects a number of stripes into the scene, and then you can reconstruct all these stripes uh, simultaneously. Um, often uh, it is still needed to project multiple of these stripe patterns uh, in order to figure out um, um, yeah, which uh, stripe corresponds to which uh, pixel here. So you have a camera and a projector. Um, but often these uh, patterns, these different patterns, can be projected very quickly. So uh, in hundreds uh, of hertz. So this kind of techniques uh, allow you to do acquisitions uh, in a matter of uh, yeah, in a matter of milliseconds. Um, so the, the benefit here is that it's, uh, it can be quite cheap. So projectors uh, are not that, uh, projectors and cameras are not that expensive. Um, it can also be quite accurate, um, but the drawback is that it's uh, uh, sensitive to, to lighting conditions. So you need, typically, you need to have a dark environment for this to work well. Another uh, non-contact technique um, here is the, the Microsoft Kinect, the first version. Um, and this is what this basically does. It, it uh, projects uh, an infrared pattern of uh, dots into the scene. Um, and then the camera looks at the scene. And um, based on the, the pattern of the dots, it, can, uh, it knows which part of the, the projector it came from. And, and because the, the projector and the camera are also calibrated, it again can uh, calculate the depth map from that. Um, yeah, the, the big advantage here is that it's just a single projection or you can have a continuous projection and a continuous capture so you can have dynamic 3D data, so basically 4D data. Um, one of the drawbacks is that it is less accurate. Um, so you do not get uh, yeah, very um, accurate results uh, in the neighborhood of sharp corners, for example. Um, it's also sensitive to light conditions, but the nice thing here is that it is yeah, it works both in, in normal light as in as in dark environment, and it is cheap because it was produced in, in large uh, quantities. Here you can see a number of 3D scanners that uh, use these principles um, and with yeah, various uh, accuracies. So these are the Artex scanners. Um, this is the Go scan. So these are yeah order of ten to twenty thousand euros. And this is the structure sensor. Right? So the structure sensor it basically uses the technique of the first Kinect. Um, and it's, it's an extension to an iPad. And you can get fairly good uh, reconstructions. And so I've, I've done some head scans, and you are in the area of 0.5 uh, millimeters on average uh, in, in accuracy. So that's quite good for, for certain applications. And it is only a few hundred euros. Um, so these are commercial scanners that use these active techniques. Um, another non-contact active technique is time of flight. And that is um, used in the, in, the, in the most recent, in the second version of Kinect. Um, and what it, how the principle works there is um, you have an infrared camera sensor. 
And then you have a, a light source that sends out infrared light. Infrared light. Um, it goes into the scene, it reflects off the scene and goes into the camera module. And the, the timing this difference between when the light was sent out and when it comes back at the camera uh, is an indication of how far away the object is. And in that way you can create um, also a 3D image. But again here, you cannot use it in sunlight because you get overexposure. Um, so it's an accurate, um, it is not that accurate at this moment, but that apparently it is, it is increasing the accuracy uh, with newer versions. Um, and and it, it happens to be uh, that these are very power efficient uh, uh, systems. So that, that can be interesting to include them in various uh, situations. So those were active techniques. Now let's have a look at uh, passive techniques. So non-contact passive techniques. The first technique is a very famous one, I think. It is stereophotogrammetry. So it basically uses two images uh, two calibrated cameras from the same scene, um, uh, looking at the same scene, and then uh, based on how far uh, a certain part of an object jumps in the picture from one to the other image, so how far it moves within the image, is an indication of how far away the object is. So objects that are close to the camera, they, are, they tend to jump from one side in, in the left picture or in the right picture to the other side in the left picture, while objects that are far away, they seem to be stationary between the two pictures. So this principle of disparity uh, can be used to create a depth map, and from that you can do a 3D reconstruction. A uh, commercial application of this is the Canfield um, system, which is basically a, a DSLR camera, which has a, a lens set a specific lens set put on top, uh, which creates a split view. It creates a, a two views of the same uh, region of interest, but with a slightly different angle. And these two images can then be used to create a depth map. It is accurate. It can be used in various lighting conditions, right? for example, outside. Um, but typically, yeah, you have a limited uh, field of view. Um, and also, um, um, it uses the texture uh, within the image to infer um, from one image to another what the corresponding pixels are. Uh, and if you have low texture surfaces like, like skin sometimes, then it, the algorithm might fail. Um, and then in such situations, you can use active stereo. So you project some light into the scene like a speckle pattern and use that uh, texture information then to do the reconstruction. Um, this is another very popular technique because it is uh, it can be cheap to set up uh, and and, and yeah, create do-it-yourself setups. Uh, it is multi-view photogrammetry, so multi-view stereo photogrammetry. Um, you can see a, a setup of uh, the company 1024. It's basically, I think, uh, more than 100 uh, DSLR cameras looking at the same person uh, in in the middle of the setup. And then they take pictures at the same exact same moment. Um, and then um, there are a number of algorithms that uh, you can use. Um, and there is existing software like the AgiSoft um, software. Um, and that uh, uses the pictures to infer the camera location. So it can calculate what the camera locations are um, just by looking at the pictures. Uh, in that way, you can get the uh, position of all the cameras. And then when you have the camera positions, you can use overlapping camera views to do stereo reconstruction. And in that way, build complete image um, of the subject. So it is a quite flexible setup. You can do all kinds of setups uh, where you uh, yeah, focus on the face or the side or the full body. Um, you typically have very high resolutions, also in texture. Um, and it is possible to do dynamic acquisitions uh, if you record video. Uh, on the downside, it requires a lot of tuning and expertise um, to get this, to get optimal results. Then finally, um, to conclude the 3D scanning part, we have volumetric techniques. 
Um, so up till now we've been scanning the outer surface of the human body, but there's also a lot of interesting things going on on the inside, like uh, yeah, certain bones or organs that you would like to image. And for that, we can use medical uh, imaging techniques. So for example, magnetic resonance imaging um, or computer tomography or ultrasound imaging. And they typically create 3D and these days also 4D images. Um, for example, here of uh, an articulating wrist. So yeah, these techniques, um, they can create very accurate internal information. So that's very nice, positive points. But on the downside is that it's accessibility. So it's very expensive equipment. You need to collaborate with a hospital to use these. Um, and, in, and in some cases you cannot, um, yeah, you cannot use it with patients because they have um, contraindications or in case of CP, for example, um, yeah, you need to justify the usage of ionizing, ionizing radiation um, because there, there is the danger of uh, it causing cancer. Um, yeah. So we can also scan the inside of the body and do anthropometry on that. Um, we also develop various scanners uh, at the TU Delft. So yeah, most notably we have uh, this hand scanner, uh, which is a, yeah, basically a collection of Raspberry Pis with camera modules that take uh, from all different angles a uh, picture of the hand and then reconstruct this into a 3D model of the hand. This is a... Um, a scanner which just measures a number of dimensions, uh, but these dimensions were identified as the most, containing the most information. And you're able to create a 3D model that is very close to an actual 3D scan or the actual foot shape. And this is a uh, stereo photogrammetry setups for paintings. Of course, 3D scanning is very, um, yeah, very powerful technique. You can collect very nice data sets, but it is also very uh, time consuming and it costs you a lot of effort and money. Uh, so luckily there are also some public databases um, and some companies that sell data. So you do not always have to collect data yourself. For example, the ICBM data of the Loney Institute has MRI scans from um, Alzheimer, studies that you can use to create uh, head and skull images or surfaces from. The company Human Solutions does all kinds of sizing surveys and they also take 3D scans. So you can also buy data from them. Or uh, you have Size China, uh, where Chinese data has been collected in the past. Uh, a database that I use a lot is the Caesar database. It was collected in the year 2000 approximately. Um, by a Dutch, an Italian, and an American institute. So you have these three target groups um, uh, available. So it's about 4,000 3D scans um, and uh, 4,000 subjects uh, in different uh, postures. So a very nice database. Uh, and you will see some more of that in the next slides. Of course, when you do scan, there is also a norm that you can use. Um, so it's, it, is, uh, it is wise to follow this norm but also take uh, into account that it can create unwanted uh, results. For example, if you're doing helmet design, then this bun uh, at the back of the head, it can be a kind of a, a pain to remove and, uh, and it might uh, in some cases be better to, yeah, to just let the hair flow uh, down um, along the back so that you have also a, a more accurate imaging in this area. Okay. So that was the part about 3D scanning. So now let's suggest, or let's imagine that we have um, collected a lot of data um, and we want to create averages. It's not so simple. Uh, we need correspondence techniques for that. And that's what I will explain in the next slides. So working with 3D scans is quite challenging. Here you can see a number of scans um, and these um, scans are from the CSER database. Um, so these are three scans. Uh, and you can see that uh, there are some holes in these scans. There are some spiky parts, some loose triangles. Um, and also most notably is that 
they have a different number of points and a different structure in, 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 uh, in their mesh. And this, as a consequence, um, makes it very difficult to calculate an average. You basically cannot calculate an average uh, just from this data. You need to take additional steps before you can do that. Um, so what is our goal? Yeah, we want to compare shapes. We want to create average shapes. We want to statistically analyze these shapes. But the problem is that there is a variation in the number of points. There is no anatomical reference, so there is no data that says that this point is the nose and that point is the ear. It's just a bunch of points uh, or a soup of triangles. So this is the, the issue here. So you have one subject with a certain point. You want to figure out what point on the surface do I have to compare it with on the other subject? That is what correspondence tries to solve. So this is the general idea. You have two scans, a bunch of points on one scan. Now you want to identify on the other scan, on the other subject, what is for each point on this subject, the corresponding point on the other subject. So this is then the result of correspondence. And I will come to techniques how to do that. Um, and we want to do this correspondence in such a way that it matches the anatomical points. So if we look at, for example, the two um, pupil centers and the tip of the nose on one subject, and we look at the corresponding points uh, for the other subjects, we also want it to be at the point of the, of, at the, point of the nose and the, um, the pupil center uh, of the eyes. So there's a number of techniques. They're called correspondence techniques. And I will um, go over a few of them. So the first technique is manual landmarking, just manual pinpointing. The second technique is uh, particle systems. Then we have parameterization-based techniques. And finally, we have surface registration or volume registration techniques. Here you can see an example of manual landmarking. So we have a number of landmarks defined. Uh, typical landmarks of the face, and we pinpoint them on one subject and on the other subject. Now for these sparse sets of points, we have a correspondence, an expert-defined correspondence. Of course, you can immediately see this is very time-consuming. It will take you hours and days and weeks to do this for a large database. And also it is yeah, error-prone, especially if you do it with multiple uh, multiple people, you can have differences in the interpretation. So you don't want that. But still, um, when you're uh, implementing a correspondence technique, often this is used as a kind of gold standard to assess how good the automated correspondence technique is. Um, this is an automated technique, particle systems. So what it basically does, it, it puts a number of particles um, a fixed number of particles, uh, say for example 100 particles uh, on top of uh, the first head and then also on the other heads. Uh, so the same number of points and then uh, the particles are uh, moved about um, in such a way that they are approximately uniformly distributed across all shapes. Um, and in addition, um, when you look at the specific landmark, um, and you look at it between the different subjects, you want the variation to be minimized. Right? So you, you want the particle to always be at a certain location on the head. Uh, so these particle systems, uh, they are interesting because they can work with arbitrary topologies. So it, they can work with uh, donut shaped uh, or, or um, like if you look at the pelvis, pelvic bone, there are a number of uh, donut shapes there. So yeah, for these kinds of uh, shapes, it's, it's easy, easy to use these techniques and it, because it, it just, you can just apply them for different topologies. But that is also the drawback. Um, so it does not um, enforce the to topology between the different uh, scans. Um, this is because the fact uh, that the, the result is a point cloud. It is not a surface. Um, here, um, University of uh, 
Utah, I believe. Um, they have developed a software system for this. So you could check this out. And I think it's mainly used in the medical domain. Um, this is another technique which I'm very familiar with, parameterization-based correspondence. Um, and, and here on the left, I explain what parameterization is. So parameterization is a technique that is basically used um, to add a texture to uh, a surface. Um, so here you have a, a surface. Um, and if you want to add a texture on this, uh, typically uh, you want to have some color values. Here it could be, for example, the hair and the eye and the skin color. Uh, then you need to store this information somewhere. And this is typically stored in a in 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 yeah, in simple image. Um, but uh, if you store it in the image, you need to correspond to the image with the um, with the um, with the three D shape. Because when you load the three D shape from disk and you load the image, then you have to transport the color values from the image onto the surface. Um, and a technique that is used to create this correspondence between the 3D shape and this flat rectangular uh, image or 2D space is to flatten it. So it is basically yeah, comparable to cartography where you take the sphere um, of the, the, the globe of, of, of our earth and you try to unfold it into a flat plane so we can e more easily observe it. Um, so we do it similar thing, but we do not uh, try to rip uh, it uh, when uh, unfolding it. And we also try to minimize the amount of distortion. So yeah, imagine that it is a rubber sheet and you start pulling this rubber sheet and pushing on the sheet until it becomes a flat square. And you do it in such a way that the total deformation is minimal. That, um, yeah, that is called a parameterization technique, a polymer parameterization technique. And you can see here, um, yeah, here is the mouth, here are the eyes, the nose, and the ears. So you can see that it flattens uh, in, in this way. And then the nice thing is if you take other subjects, so here we have three subjects, and you also flatten them, and you also try to minimize distortion, then they, um, end up, so the, the different parts of the head, end up in the same regions of the image plane. Um, and that is interesting because then you can go from one head to the image plane, and then from this image plane to another head. And um, because you did the parameterization or the flattening in a consistent way and in a distortion minimizing way, um, going from one to another head through the parameterization domain um, gives you a correspondence with anatomical, uh, yeah, with an anatomical correspondence. So this is a very powerful, powerful technique. Uh, the nice thing is that you get a guaranteed one-to-one -one correspondence between points of one subject and points of the other subject. Um, the drawback is that you need to supply these uh, input surfaces with very strict topology. So it needs to be uh, topologically a disk. There cannot be holes, there cannot be handles, because then the algorithm fails. So that is a, a drawback of these correspondence-based techniques. Then you have um, techniques that uh, are for volumetric uh, data. Here it is uh, explained in 2D. So you have a cat and a goat, I believe. And you're now uh, deforming the blue one, the goat, so that it matches up with the cat. And then uh, this deformation determines the correspondence. And so this blue point of the goat, it went all the way up to the ear here, or to the head here of the cat. So then you have this blue cor point corresponding to that red point. Um, this is often uh, used in, in, in medical imaging, where, where they want to look at, for example, pre and post surgery of a single subject, or they want to compare different subjects. Um, and then they use volumetric registration techniques. Um, that is kind of explained here. So you have some 
subject that you choose uh, and you register to each of the other individuals and once you have done the registration you can create an average it's shown here uh, and then that average is in correspondence with all of the uh, subjects and each subject can be corresponded to the other subject via this average um, yeah so that's a uh, volumetric registration the benefit here is that you have volume correspondences so you can yeah it's more than just surface correspondences you can also look at the internal structures and analyze those and do measurements and anthropometry on the internal structures um, the drawback is that um, it's very computationally in uh, in intensive um, and that yeah you need specific expertise for this uh, sometimes you also work with surface to volume registration so then you typically already have a kind of 3d surface uh, of the sub of the uh, object of interest in this case the heart um, and you put that surface inside the volume of a new subject and you deform the surface so that it lines up with the contours in the image of the new subject and in that way you're using uh, surface deformation and registration to capture um, the new shape of the, the patient, of the new uh, subject. Um, yeah, the benefit here is that um, it, uh, yeah, it, it is, uh, yeah, it's a fast, it can be a fast technique, uh, less computationally intensive than, um, than the uh, volume to volume registration. Um, yeah. And then we have surface to surface registration. So this is, I think, uh, a very important uh, technique um, because it is used uh, a lot uh, when you are uh, talking about 3D anthropometry. So, so the, the technique to take some uh, reference surface and deform that reference surface into your subject here in orange uh, is called surface registration. And it is, uh, there's, there's many algorithms for this. Um, and therefore it is also, yeah, it is, it's a, a popular technique. Um, and there is also commercial software available to do this. Uh, that will help us um, um, to, yeah, to do the correspondence and statistical shape model, modeling uh, in the later part in this tutorial. So what, you, what happens here is we take a reference and we have our target subject. It's our orange person here. Um, and the orange person has all kinds of holes, etc. But the reference is a perfect surface with a perfect uh, geometry and uh, triangles and points. Uh, and we want to take this perfect geometry and use it to describe the shape of the subject. And how we do that is through um, surface registration. So we take this surface. Um, and we make it elastic and we put it on top of the uh, target and then we push uh, or we pull it towards the orange surface and in the beginning uh, the reference so the gray one is still very stiff so it basically roughly aligns but yeah along the road uh, when you add more and more iterations we allow the surface the reference surface to become more and more elastic and then you will see that the smaller features of the reference are lining up to the target. And what you have here in the end is a deformed reference. Um, so this is an elastic deformation technique with gradually increasing elasticity. Um, the drawback is here that the surface can fold onto itself. Um, there are all kinds of techniques to avoid that. Um, the benefit is that it can be quite fast, a matter of seconds and that there is no pre-processing required. So you, you can just leave the holes in the 3D scan um, and it can be interpolated by the, uh, by the reference. Um, here you can see this technique in action. Uh, do it again. So here you have the gray reference slowly deforming into the uh, yellow target hand. And here you have uh, another technique specifically for feet. It starts with a rough template does the registration until it converges then it increases um, the resolution of the template and then it further uh, further registers the final detail so that these are 
these are two of these uh, techniques uh, for elastic surface, res surface registration um, that you can use um, to create a correspondence. And how do you get the correspondence um, with this reference and this elastic registration? Well, you just basically use the same reference and you register it to each of the subjects in your database. And you can see here that it nicely deformed to each of the subjects' heads. And then this is the result. But underneath this surface is the same mesh. So it has the same number of points, same number of triangles, and the points and triangles are at corresponding locations. Um, and what we typically do is, yeah, the first time you use a reference, it ne does not necessarily, uh, is not necessarily a good reference. And so here it was an Asian reference that we used. Uh, and that might influence the registration negatively, and that we call a bias, reference bias. So how do we remove that bias? So we take the deformed references, and we calculate the average of the population. And then we redo this whole procedure, but instead of using the original reference, we use the average as a reference. And we use this procedure a number of times, for example, three times, and then you will see that uh, uh, possible bias um, caused by using a, a bit of an odd reference is removed. And this is the final result, um, corresponding meshes for the different head shapes uh, of our subjects. And then before we can start analyzing um, the differences in shape, we still have to do one more step and that is surface alignment. Because if you scan people, usually they are in different postures and they are instructed to be in a standard posture, but still they have subtle differences in their posture. And then when you're going to create averages or you're going to compare one subject with another, you're not only looking at the differences in shape, but also the differences in posture or, or pose. Um, and you want to avoid that. So there is a technique and that's called generalized procrustes analysis. And it basically takes uh, all the scans, uh, all the uh, registered uh, scans, um, which now have the same number of so, uh, same number of points, uh, and it creates an average, and then it takes each subject and it aligns that subject uh, least squares to the average using the corresponding points, um, and it iterates this a few times until convergence, and then you get a situation like this. So here there was still a lot of difference in head orientation. Here it is removed. And then we can use this data set for further analysis. And that's where we are now. Statistical shape modeling. So this is the, the anthropometric part. All the rest was pre-processing, 3D scanning, um, processing of the scans so that you can do statistical analysis and creating a correspondence. Um, aligning them properly. But now we have the statistical shape modeling, which is basically creating average shape and mapping out the shape variations in the database. Let's, let's have a look uh, <coughs> how it's done. So yeah, this is a familiar figure, I think. It also uses principal component analysis. As we looked at in the multivariate anthropometry. Uh, there we also use principal component analysis. So here we have our database of uh, head scans and they were already registered with a common template. So they have a, a nice distribution of points and all the points are corresponding between the subjects using these correspondence techniques. Um, and then what we do is we do principal component analysis. When we were doing multivariate anthropometry, we did principal component analysis on the measurements. Now we are doing principal component analysis on the point coordinates. Typically, such a surface has 10,000, 20,000 points, and each point has three coordinates, X, Y, and Z. So you get tens of thousands of variables. Um, uh, that you set out uh, at tens of thousands different axes. 
Um, so we have here the first axis is the coordinate of the first marker. This is then uh, the second axis is the, the, the coordinate of the second marker. Uh, the markers are these different points and so on. So we have a lot of axes, high dimensional space and um, each subject is one point within this space. And then again, you calculate the average of these points um, and then you get an average shape. And that's what is shown here in the middle. This is the average head shape based on, these, uh, on this database. Um, then you still, on top of this um, average, you want to know what are the variations in shape. And for that, you look at this point of clouds and you identify the major axes of the point cloud. Um, and the first and largest axis is what we call the principal component one. And then perpendicular to that, we have a, a space which is one dimension smaller. And uh, we can again look there for our second uh, most uh, large direction uh, and define our second principal component axis there. Um, and then what this looks like is uh, the following. So here we have PC1. So this is this dia diagonal going from the right bottom through the mean all the way to the top left. Um, and going from this yeah, female looking small face all the way to this large looking or this male looking large face, it corresponds to going in this direction. So going from one side of the first principal component to the other side. Principal component two here has to do with the chin. So it's a long versus short chin. That's basically this direction in the data. And so on. Um, the color map here on the average surface is a color, so it's a color code. And it basically what it does here, it takes um, all the points. So if you, for example, take the tip of the nose, and you take all the nose tips then they form like a group of points. And the size of this group um, basically deter determines so how far they are apart, determines how variable the nose is. Um, and if there is a lot of variability, then we color code it with reddish. If there is a little variability, we color code it with bluish. Um, <clears throat> so in this way, you can see yeah, which part of the face are more variable than others. And this is what we call a statistical shape model. And here we have another uh, statistical shape model. So this was a statistical shape model from uh, Dutch subjects, a thousand subjects. It was mixed males and females. Um, and you can see here the first principal components. So principal component one, as we typically have with biological shapes is size differences. And correlated with the size difference is gender difference. So going from male body type to female body type. Second principal component in this case is aspect ratio. In this case, it goes from, um, yeah, so the height is approximately the same, but uh, the subjects become much, uh, much wider. Uh, and and um, so their body mass basically increases. Um, then you can see the, the third and the fourth component, they show differences in posture. So these are partly differences of natural posture, but also unnatural differences because they had to stand in a specific posture. Um, this uh, mode here, this is mode number six, it encodes uh, female differences, male to female differences. So you can see that the breasts are appearing and the typical um, typical uh, yeah, eight shape uh, of the female body. Um, okay, so that's a statistical shape model. Uh, and there are interesting things that you can do with this shape model. So you can look at a statistical shape model like this. It is an average surface, the population average. Um, and this average can be varied, so it can be, its shape can be changed um, by the principal components. For example, the first principal component here, you can see all the arrows going up and down, 
it makes the subject smaller and larger. That's what the first principal component encodes. The second principal component makes the subject heavier or lighter. And actually, you can add these, these uh, shape differences or these shape modes, as we call them. You can add them onto the mean by turning these knobs. So you can turn the knobs, and then the subject becomes longer or smaller or heavier or lighter. And in that way, you can use the statistical model to create body shapes. So you can approximate the body shapes uh, within the database, but you can also create new body shapes, um, generating virtual populations, for example. So let's have a look at what you can do with such statistical models and with these 3D anthropometry uh, techniques. So uh, one thing that you can do is measuring body shape uh, through model fitting, shape model fitting. So here we have our statistical shape model um, that we can uh, change shape by turning these knobs and by changing the principal components. Here we have our subject scan. So it's a new subject that comes into our store, for example. Um, and we want to do some measurements with this subject. So what we do is we take this model, we put it on top of the subject scan, and we start turning the knobs until the shape uh, aligns and deforms into the body shape of the subject. This is then the result. Uh, and because we can add additional information, uh, for example, here our shape model, it had different zones for the limbs and the head and the torso. It makes us much easier to identify uh, certain contours or sections where we can measure uh, circumferences, for example, for uh, determining clothing size. So through model fitting, you can robustly interpret um, a 3D body scan of a subject and use that for size selection or even for customizing a product. It is also being used, uh, for example, in the fitness industry for monitoring progress. And here are three uh, examples. Uh, three examples of um, scanning systems together with software packages that uh, allow you to do this monitoring. And it uses a kind of model fitting tool. Another example here is, um, yeah, you can use these 3D body models to approximate um, the body shape of your customer. And then you can use this approximate body shape to trade clothes uh, around in a virtual situation. Uh, for example, if you're uh, creating customized uh, sweaters, which are at the, at the point of purchase not available because you need, to, yeah, you need to make them made to measure to the customer. Um, so they're not available when, when, uh, when the purchase is made, but you can use um, virtual fitting software to try to convince the customer. Uh, and you can see here a virtual simulation of the sweater. And this was uh, the result afterwards um, when it was knitted. And you can see that there is, yeah, it's, there's quite a good resemblance. Um, but there was still room for improvement. Um, another application is the creation of head forms. Um, this was a study done at the University of Delft uh, by Roger Ball and Johan Molenbroek. Um, and you have the, yeah, basically the helmet standard. Uh, you have the EN 960 Western standard, um, but there were issues because Chinese head forms are different from, uh, from European head forms. Uh, so the helmets were not uh, fitting properly. Um, so they, yeah, they had to revise this and, and create a, a new set of head forms. Um, and they did this by uh, statistical shape modeling. So by creating a correspondence between 3D scanned Chinese subjects and by creating averages for different head sizes. Um, this is another application where we created a face model um, that we um, embedded within SolidWorks. And then within SolidWorks, our uh, company customer or client um, were able to uh, create 3D designs uh, of uh, glasses and come up with uh, sizing systems because they could 
uh, create uh, 3D head shapes, for example, P5, P50, P95 in width, and then see how the head shape and the face shape changes when you have these different head sizes, um, and then optimize the, the different sizes of the glasses for that. Uh, this is a research that we did for Philips for the uh, rewriting uh, or updating of the design guidelines uh, for headphones and earphones. So what we did for them is um, we um, built uh, a database of 3D scans uh, of Western and uh, Asian ears. So the ear, the auricle was scanned together with the ear canal based on a silicon mold. Um, a silicon mold was laser scanned and then these laser scans were corresponded and statistically modeled. And then you have this uh, average ear shape and you can also see different uh, ear shape modes. Uh, for example, you have differences in size of the ear lobe or the, the auricle, but you also have differences in um, the angle of the head uh, or the ear canal versus the, the auricle. Um, then Philips used this to identify different clusters within the population uh, and they came up with specifically Western groups and specifically uh, Asian groups, but also some mixed groups. And then they used this um, information to create um, design guidelines, but also uh, tips, different uh, tips to put on your uh, in-ear headphone. So this is uh, going from a target population through statistical modeling to population analysis and finally new design guidelines, which they are currently using. Um, yeah, we've built various models uh, from the head amongst others for headset um, um, design or optimization and for helmet optimization. We used MRI scans for this at some point uh, because they, it had the interesting property that there is no hair. Uh, this was interesting for us when we were working on uh, brain-computer interfaces where the electrodes need to make contact with the skin surface. Uh, so we want to exclude the hair. Um, and we also built a model uh, including the skull. And this was interesting because then you get an idea of the soft tissue region or soft tissue thickness. Uh, and this soft tissue thickness might give you some information of uh, yeah, where you could apply pressure and where, where not. Um, well, it was hypothesized that regions where there was lo uh, uh, lower uh, thickness, that uh, you may be better not uh, put too much pressure there. But it's still to be, the, to be proven. Um, this is a, also a head model, but it was from, uh, from the CSER database derived. So there are more subjects there, uh, 1,400 subjects. The drawback there is that you have, yeah, you have the, the hair is stuck underneath the head cap, uh, and there is this bun made for people with long hair. Uh, so the drawback is that, um, especially if you have a lot of females in the population, that you have this bump in the final average model uh, that is basically a leftover of averaging all the ponytails. Interesting things that you can do with this, you can create a statistical model of symmetric face shapes, but also create a model of face asymmetries. And you can use this to take into account during product uh, design. Uh, this is a currently ongoing work uh, where we also um, try to create uh, uh, physical models um, using 3D printing and silicon casting. Uh, and the nice thing that we want to achieve here is that we want to have um, a mannequin that is mimicking the soft tissue layer, but still has also uh, the bony parts inside so that the soft softness or, or um, the compressibility of the head varies uh, depending on the location on the head. So that's ongoing research. And you could use this to uh, do physical tests with oxygenation masks or, or helmets or anything um, and, and taking in this process soft tissue aspects um, into account.
instead of just using a rigid mannequin. Um, yeah, we also use this data for uh, for helmet uh, optimizations. And as I said, yeah, we used MRI data, uh, and there is brain uh, process or, or brain image processing software that allows you to extract the the scalp surface and the skull surface. Uh, and this helped us a lot to create these uh, statistical shape models. Um, we also used this uh, P50 mannequin that we derived from uh, the CSER data uh, from the MRI database to create a finite element model for thermal comfort testing and also to create a thermal testing mannequin uh, that was used in a wind tunnel. And the advantage is that, um, yeah, instead of using some model that is available where you do not know uh, how the head shape was constructed or it is not reflecting your target population, that you now can use um, 3D anthropometry to create head forms specifically for your uh, target population and then build um, from that head form uh, thermal mannequins or simulation mannequins. So it will add to the, um, to the consistency of your testing results and your user evaluation results. Um, this was a model built uh, for splint, wrist splint design. So we have, uh, I think we had about uh, 200 hand and arm scans um, where we created uh, um, a statistical shape model and again, you can see, for example, the first mode, it, it encodes differences in, in hand size. Um, and this uh, information, uh, so the average shape and the shape variations, this is interesting information to create, for example, a sizing system for braces. Or you can use this model and 3D scanning um, and model fitting of the 3D. Uh, yeah, you can take this statistical shape model, and you can fit the model onto a new 3D scan of the subject and then um, identify in that way where the fingers are, where the wrist is, and use this information for uh, design automation. So automating um, the design of a wrist splint, 3D printed wrist splint, um, based on um, a 3D scan and a shape model. Um, yeah, what we also did uh, is, you know, we did research in footwear personalization and then we were specifically focusing on identifying whether um, a, a scan, a 3D scan of a subject um, has a normal shape or whether there are some abnormalities with this person's foot. Uh, and how we did that, so we created a database of healthy individuals and we scanned their feet and then we could create a model of the average healthy foot and the average uh, and the healthy foot variations and then we have a subject coming into the store and we take a 3d scan of the subject and we compare it with the healthy model and where it deviates a lot from the healthy model we have reason to believe that there is an abnormality and for example here that is the case for example for this person it has a hallux valgus foot so the the big toe has a bit of a angle and um, the metatarsal head here is um, uh, sticking out a bit. And that was detected by comparing it with a healthy population. We also did similar things for the pressure underneath the foot and combined with, uh, uh, with the shape information, um, you can uh, yeah, derive um, parameters for the design of your uh, orthotic, for example, an insole, or for a shoe to correct and support these abnormalities. Um, this is another application of um, 3D anthropometry in the medical field. Um, here we have um, a fracture fixation plates. So the, uh, the green colored plate here, it's a titanium plate from Acumet in this case, Acumet company. Um, and when a subject breaks, fractures his clavicle, uh, sometimes it is fixated uh, with such a plate. And what you want to avoid is that you need to do a lot of uh, deformation of the plate during surgery because, yeah, that takes a lot of time 
it uh, may also um, have an impact on the mechanical properties of the, the plate. So you want to avoid um, that. Uh, so what the companies typically do, they create a si kind of sizing system for these plates. And it's fairly complicated because you can have a whole range of clavicles, a whole range of clavicle shapes. And what we did here is we created a model of the clavicle based on a database of clavicles. And we uh, simulated fractures. And then we tried to simulate uh, positioning uh, a, fracture play, a fracture fixation plate on top of the fractured bone, making sure that it has enough screws to fixate the two parts. And then we look at how well does the plate fit without deforming it. Um, and then we do that for a whole number of subjects and we can then average this um, deviation between the, the plate and the bone for these different subjects and for the different plates. And that's what we did here. So the red zones are basically the parts of the plate where the distance between the plate and the bone was large after putting it on the bone. So it gives you an indication that probably, yeah, you need to adapt this plate a little bit so that uh, it, it better fits to the, um, to the variability of clavicle shapes. Uh, what we also did is compare different companies. So we compared Acumet with uh, the plates of uh, Synthes, and we also compared it with straight plates. And you could see that, yeah, this uh, Acumet plate set was the best. It's, it has the, on average, the lowest uh, distance between plate and bone, and the straight uh, set has, of course, the largest uh, arrows. Um, I think this is the final um, application or case I wanted to, to discuss with you. Uh, so we also used um, CT imaging uh, basically CB, so cone beam CT from the head to look at the nasal cavity. Um, so we wanted to study nasal obstruction and, and yeah, whether there is a relation between obstruction and the shape of the nasal cavity. Um, and for that, we are building a statistical model. So we are gathering data. I think we have 50 to 100 subjects now. And we also, yeah, we extract this air pocket in the nose and throat. Um, and then we build a correspondence between the different subjects and create a statistical shape model. Uh, and here you can see this uh, statistical shape model with the different principal components. So you can see that there are differences in, in length, um, for example, and, and um, other differences. And such a model uh, can be very interesting to uh, just yeah, analyze the anatomy. Um, but also to yeah, use as a, um, a model in finite element simulations to study airflow. And for example, to optimize nasal applicators to deliver uh, certain medicine particles uh, to the right places in, into the nasal cavity. So, yeah, that's also an application of 3D anthropometry um, for medical device design. So thanks. That was the uh, part about 3D anthropometry. The next part will be also about 3D anthropometry, but then very applied. Uh, basically a kind of tutorial on how you can do it yourself. See you in a few minutes. Hi. So in about the first hour, hour and a half, we talked about one dimensional, two dimensional and 3D anthropometry. Um, and I also demonstrated that you can do 1D and 2D anthropometry uh, with the Dynac platform. But now 3D anthropometry um, is a bit more complicated. Um, and in the following two presentations, I will first give you a method to do 3D anthropometry um, with desktop software, which is a low cost software. Uh, and in the second presentation, you will, I will uh, demonstrate uh, how you can do 3D anthropometry with our predefined databases with the Dynamic platform. So let's start with the first approach, um, hands-on 3D anthropometry. 
Um, I've named this build your own mannequins. So here is the idea. So we have a number of 3D scans. These are full body scans, but it can also be body parts um, or internal body structures. Um, <clears throat> and you want to create um, a, a design mannequin from this. Uh, so an average mannequin. Um, and you analyze your database, you look at the measurements and you say, okay, I, uh, I want to have a small mannequin um, that is based on a group of people within the database that I assign to the small size. And then you can create for this small size an average mannequin. And we use two softwares for that. So first of all, we use um, RAP. So it's a Russian software which does surface wrapping or elastic registration. Um, and it is used to build um, um, a correspondence between the 3D scans. And then we use Paraview, which is a free software, uh, open source, to go from the correspondence set to the average mannequin. And you can do this uh, at home. And for research purposes, both softwares are free. And Paraview is also free for commercial software uh, purposes. There are actually uh, four steps. The first step is correspondence using RAP. The second step is selecting subjects based on the Excel table with, with uh, subject measurements. The third step is averaging the subjects in Paraview. And the fourth step is saving it all or saving the resulting uh, design mannequin as an OBJ file, for example, and then using it in your application. So um, we've been talking a lot about uh, correspondence and this is again uh, uh, one way of visualizing what correspondence is so we have a template a common template we have here two subjects of a large database um, as an illustration we have two subjects and we want to analyze the body shape for example create an average of these two but it is difficult because there are holes and different number of points so what we do we take a template and we uh, deform it into the subject one so we get a description of the body shape of subject one but with the template geometry of uh, yeah, of this uh, template here and now we do the same thing to subject two so we take the template we deform it in subject two so we get a nice description of the body shape of subject two but with the geometry of the template now we can do a point by point averaging to create an average mannequin. But uh, this step going from the template to the uh, deformed template, that's a yeah, challenging mathematical procedure. Um, and there is up to recently no software available for that. Uh, you had to go to hit GitHub, uh, download some software, make it compile yourself. And, and you had to be a programmer, an engineer to work with this. But uh, yeah, since a few years, we have uh, RAP. So it's a Russian software from R3DS. Um, it's, uh, yeah, in this case, I use RAP version 3. It is used in the movie industry um, for creating virtual characters from 3D scans uh, for yeah, CGI, I imagine. Um, so we use RAP version 3, uh, and there uh, you can download the software here and you can get a license, a free license, um, if you're uh, an academic. If you're not an academic, it's only 400 euros, so it is not that uh, expensive. There's a bunch of tutorials, uh, but I will guide you through the steps necessary for corresponding a database. So this is an overview of the software. So here you can see the meshes, for example, the target 3D scan, uh, the subject scan, and your uh, reference, your common reference. Um, here you can see the, uh, the node layout. So these are the different processing steps that you take uh, in, the, um, in the elastic registration. And here are some parameters settings. Uh, you have different view tabs. So you have a 3D view, but you can also have a, a 2D view uh, that is used for pinpointing landmarks on both surfaces. At the bottom here, you have uh, a timeline, and the timeline can be different steps in a movie or in a moving uh, body shape, but in our case, it will be the different subjects, so subject one, two, three, four, etc. 
And the nice thing uh, of, of RAP is that you can use the timeline to do patch processing. So you all set it up for the first time point. And then for the other time points, you just specify what data sets you want to load. And then it applies the whole, uh, the, the wrapping procedure to the whole database. So this is our layout that we use uh, to do the wrapping. So here, load geometry, this loads our reference, so our common template surface. And target, this will be our subjects in our database, so the 3D scans. And depending on the time point in our uh, timeline at the bottom of the software, this will be a uh, subject one, two, three, and so on. Here, landmarks. Um, so the landmarks are loaded um, either from files, and since we use the Caesar database, we have the landmarks um, available in text format. Uh, we also have the landmarks for uh, so for the target and for the reference. Uh, or you can use manual pinpointing of the landmarks. That's also possible. Uh, then you can select some free polygons. So this is parts of the surface, so uh, of the, the, the template surface that you're going to deform that have to um, move along with the elastic registration, but that will not be adjusted uh, based on uh, 3D scan information. And for example, for the hands and the feet, you select these as as free polygons, because the hands and the feet are not well scanned, so you rather not use that data. But there are some markers on the hands and feet which are well scanned, and um, so the markers will take care of the hand size. Uh, then the first step is rigid alignment based on the markers. So we have the markers on the on the template and the markers on the 3D scan. So it's like 60 markers, and then you uh, rigidly align them so that the markers are as close as possible to each other. And that's a good starting point for the uh, non-rigid uh, or the elastic registration. The elastic registration is this part, so it's the wrapping. It takes both surfaces as an input, also the free polygons, uh, which it should ignore during the elastic registration, and the landmarks and the initial alignment. And from there on, it creates the the wrapping, uh, so the deformation of the target uh, of the template into the subject 3D scan. Then we increase the resolution of the uh, the template a little bit, and we project the template onto the subject so that we get uh, an accurate uh, fit uh, of the template onto the 3D scan. And then we write it uh, as our correspondent mesh. Um, and we basically do this for all time points uh, during uh, in a batch processing uh, way. So it can all run in parallel while, uh, while you're sleeping uh, overnight. So here an example. So we have our template mesh and we have our 3D scan from the Caesar database. You can see the I also already loaded all the landmarks that we have from the Caesar database. Um, then you can pinpoint the landmarks one time on the reference uh, surface and also save them to a file to be used later on um, for the other time points. And uh, now you do the rigid alignment. So that's this board. And you can see that, yeah, they're already nicely aligned. Um, you can uh, make also the scaling already uh, uh, similar so yeah, that's that's a great initialization for the for the surface wrapping, um, and the alignment is based on the the landmarks of both surfaces. Um, then we have the free polygons. As I said, we take the hands and the feet as free polygons because the three D scans are really bad in that area. Um, and then we do the wrapping, and I can show it you here. Uh, this is a, a video recording of the wrapping, so it it now is computing one frame. So it starts, uh, the, the first part here is a bit of pre-processing that it does. And now it's going to do the first iteration of wrapping uh, for one subject. Hopla. So it's very fast. And uh, now it is going to increase the resolution a bit. Um, you can see a bit further, so there's um, a denser set of points, um, which takes a bit larger, longer. And now this is the final set of points. Um, and yeah, you can see it, it's a, it's a perfect, uh, 
perfect match at the end. So here you can see the target. Oh, it's the next slide. The target and uh, uh, the reference template uh, on top of each other. So you can see here um, the blue part is the 3D scan and the greenish part is the, the deformed template. Um, you can see here that the hand is registered quite okay, so the hand size is probably right because of these landmarks. That there's a few landmarks here. But of course, the fingers are a bit weirdly postured or positioned. Um, you can ignore this if you're not working with the hands, or you can add additional landmarks, but that will complicate uh, the procedure, of course. But you can see there is little information here of the hands and also for the feet, this is the case. So that's why we use three polygons. Um, this is then the result that we improved in. Uh, so basically we subdivided the results. So we get a higher resolution and then we project it uh, onto the 3D scan. So we get a very good fit and then finally save it. And we do this for all uh, scans in the database, and then you get a, a very big uh, set of uh, correspondent surface uh, surfaces. So I have done this already for the Caesar database, so for 4,000 scans. Um, if you are interested in this, I can uh, work with you uh, uh, together on this data, so please uh, contact me if you want to work with this. And then uh, if you have the correspondence available, then the next step is to select some subjects that you want to create um, a design mannequin for. And I, just as an example here, I selected the 10 smallest um, individuals. I basically took the measurement table from the individuals and I sorted them by stature. Um, and then I took the 10 smallest individuals. I record their, their number, scan number, and then I load them in Paraview. So Paraview is a free software uh, for uh, visualization and processing of uh, scientific data sets. You can also use it for creating uh, or for processing uh, to some extent surface meshes. So you load them into Paraview. Here you can see our 10 correspondent uh, 3D scans, the 10 smallest subjects in our database. And then we apply a programmable filter with a small uh, code. So we have to copy paste this code here. I provide this code uh, also in this presentation and then it creates uh, an average mannequin out of these 10 subjects. So just a few simple steps to create average mannequins. Uh, and you can create different sizes or you can look at one size uh, for your product and have, <coughs> have maybe the largest subjects in your size create a design mannequin from that or of the smallest subjects and create a design mannequin from that. Uh, and then you have a range of design mannequins for one size that you can use for your design. So this is basically the, the different steps you have to take in this part of you. Uh, so you load in the shapes, you apply, uh, you select all shapes, then you apply the programmable filter. You copy paste this code into the, into this text box here, box there and then press the apply button and the average surface shows up. That is your design mannequin. Um, so here I show uh, an example um, that I recently did for the uh, ISO standardization committee. So it's actually an ongoing study, but we are thinking about uh, redefining the EN960 head forms um, and doing this redefinition based on 3D scan data. So what I did is I took the Caesar database, I extracted the head, uh, and I uh, calculated a correspondence between all the heads uh, of the subjects in the database. Um, and then I created different sizes. So, well, here you have the different sizes of helmets. So 50 up to 62 centimeters in circumference of head circumference. Uh, for the smallest and the largest, I could not create an, uh, a size. So for A and D, uh, A and O are excluded because I don't have data for that. So those are children and, and very, very big persons. But for all the other ones, I have quite a big uh, number of scans that I can use to create uh, an average mannequin for each size. So here you can see the 
head uh, correspondent head meshes. So these are five out of 1400 that I used. Um, and then I created uh, five sizes. So from 52 uh, to 60 centimeters in head circumference. And for each size, I took a kind of range of four centimeters in head circumference around this circumference to gather subjects. And then I made sure that I have an equal amount of subjects that are smaller than the size and that are larger than the size. So that on average, the head circumference is about um, the same as the uh, head or helmet size. And then I used the uh, uh, paraview to create averages. And this is the result. So you can see here from 520 to 600, five different head mannequins. Um, and you can see that these are much more detailed than the original EN 960 standard, uh, which actually does not have a face. Uh, so we are now looking into this, whether this can be a replacement uh, for the current standard or whether the current standard is uh, close enough to what we see here. This little bump at the back is due to the fact that uh, yeah, in the smaller sizes we have a lot of females and we have ponytails that show up in the 3D scans, so we have to exclude this part from the analysis. Um, so there is code that you can use uh, on GitHub, on my GitHub account. Um, I have here the Paraview programmable filter code that you have to use in Paraview. It is just copy-paste, so you don't have to be a programmer. And I also have a calc model here, so it allows you to create a shape model. So not only an average surface, but also the surface variations, um, shape variations, and you can, yeah, you can use this uh, Python script if you're familiar with Python. So thanks uh, for uh, this part. The next part is um, 3D anthropometry using uh, the DNet platform, DNet mannequin platform. Okay, welcome to our second part on hands-on 3D anthropometry. Um, and in the previous uh, part, you um, were working or you, uh, we were working with um, 3D scans um, from the CSER database, but the procedure that I explained can also be applied to any set or any database of 3D scans that you have yourself for your project. Um, but of course, it takes a lot of processing steps to do the 3D anthropometry to arrive at the uh, final model um, and the, the design mannequins. Um, so at the TU Delft, um, we thought of a a platform, uh, an extension of the Dynet platform that would make it easier, um, even easier to do 3D anthropometry studies based on data sets that are, are widely applicable. So what we did, we created an extension of the Dynet website, um, which allows us to do 3D anthropometry and we are adding data sets to that now. Currently we have two data sets, the CSER database for full body scans and we have the, um, the GoTo database, which has child head scans. Um, and this platform makes it much easier to do 3D anthropometry studies, as we will see now. So I'll give you a tutorial on that. Um, but first of all, let's explain um, what is behind this uh, new platform, the Dynet platform. It is built on statistical shape modeling but something additional to that called anthropometric statistical shape modeling. Um, so here, this is a picture that we saw before. So on the left, we have a number of 3D scans. Uh, this is basically our database of 3D scans, which have already been corresponded. So we can apply principal component analysis to create a statistical shape model. And that is what you see in the center here. So this is the average head and these are the different shape modes. Now you can play with these shape modes to create new shapes, but actually they are not very intuitive in what their meaning is. For example, the first shape mode, it is indeed, it is indeed related to size, so it definitely expresses the size difference in the database, but it is also correlated with gender. Um, and while this is still quite clear, other principal components might be less clear what they actually mean. 
Um, so they, while this is a mathematical model that is very, very compact representation of the shape variation present in the database, it is not necessarily um, an intuitive model to work with for designers and ergonomists. So what we did there to solve this problem is um, try to relate this shape model to simple subject features. Um, so here you can see um, a small extract of a table. Um, so these are basically measurements that were also available for each of these uh, 3D scanned heads. And um, well, these are familiar for, for people who are working with um, head um, wearable design. So our idea was, well, can we not create um, a model that is steerable by these features? Um, and actually this was an idea that was already um, proposed in 2003 by uh, Brett Allen. And um, we're basically adopting this and making it um, yeah, user, in a user-friendly way available to designers. Um, so here you have a statistical shape model that uh, allows us to describe um, the shape, uh, a specific shape, uh, by taking an average, the average shape, and a some combination of uh, the shape modes. And there are weighting factors applied to the shape modes. Um, on the other hand, we have the, uh, the subject features for each of these scans. And for each of these scans, we also have the specific principal component weights. And then we can find a linear relation between the features of these subjects and the principal component weights. Um, and we do that by a linear regression, basically. So we create a linear regression model that relates these uh, simple um, measurements, body measurements, to these uh, principal component weights. And that allows us to create 3D shapes, plausible 3D shapes that um, that correspond to um, a number of measurements that we provide. Um, so here you can see an example. Um, this is a head model, and here you see the width of the nose bridge in this part, and the, uh, the distance between the, the top of the ears. Um, so there is some, some correlation here due to size differences. Um, and well, what we basically did, we, we kept a fixed head width and then generated two heads with different nose widths. Um, here you can see, so it is 50 percentile uh, head width and then a two and a half percentile nose width and 97 and a half percentile nose width. So we have a, a narrow and a wide nose with a standard head. Um, so what you basically uh, do um, is you supply these um, measurement uh, percentiles. Uh, the, um, you translate them in actual measurement values and you fill them in in this equation and this gives you the uh, corresponding weights and with these weights you create uh, a shape and that's basically this shape that you see here for this mannequin and here for the other mannequin. So what we have done here is we, we have taken a statistical shape model and with linear uh, regression related to statistical shape model with the original measurement values. And by turning the model around, we were able to um, predict three-dimensional shapes from um, simple body measurements. Um, and that is what we uh, implemented uh, behind this platform that is called the BNET Mannequin. Um, and mannequin because yeah, the, the main purpose here is to generate design mannequins from your population. Um, so I will go through uh, the different windows here, so the different parts uh, of the, the interface uh, to uh, explain basically uh, what the functionality is and how you can create design mannequins. So um, yeah, what you can see here is a number of screens. And so you have the population panel here. Here you have the panel where you basically uh, define uh, the measurements that you want to use to predict the shapes. And here you uh, supply the actual values for each of your design mannequins. Here you have a scatter plot, uh, which allows you to uh, plot uh, two of the, uh, yeah, you can have more than two 
measurements here, but you can only scatter plot two at one time. Um, and this gives you an idea of the variation within the population uh, plotted along two dimensions. And here you have the, uh, the, the design mannequins that correspond with the personas here in the persona panel. Um, and each of these mannequins is also indicated here in the population. So you get a good view of where the design mannequins are and what the body shape is in that region of the population. So let's go through the different screens now. So this is the population pop panel. It allows you to select um, a population. In this case, we selected the Dutch uh, subjects uh, from the CSER database. And we chose female, and then we can uh, yeah, choose an age range. And then we have defined our population from which we internally built a statistical shape model. And then um, in the next step, when we are uh, defining the measurements, we will do the linear regression modeling. Uh, currently, we have two data sets in our platform. So we have the child head data set, which was collected by uh, Lie Goto. Um, and this is about 300 uh, children between six months and uh, seven years of age. And we also have the CSER database. Currently, we have included the Dutch version. Uh, so that's approximately a thousand 3D scans. We are extending this to the Italian and the US version very soon. Um, then after selecting the population, we have our um, measurement panel, measures selection and mannequin definition panel, where you basically select measures. And so you can add a number of measures that you want to use to control the body shape. And typically when you're designing a product, um, for example, a helmet that there's a number of um, body measurements uh, that are critical for that design. And I think in, in the case of helmets, it's head circumference, head width, head length that are very critical. So those are the measurements that you would supply here then. Um, and then you could use our um, interface to explore the variation um, of these three measurements within the population and to generate various design mannequins uh, to cover the population. Um, so here we selected like body mass, um, stature and waist circumference. Um, and let's see, uh, we kept body mass and stature fixed. So it's fixed height, uh, fixed weight, but we varied the weight circu uh, waist circumference. And then you can see here that you have different body shapes um, for these uh, three mannequins. Um, so yeah. Here you define the measures and here you define the personas. You can add an, an additional uh, number of personas. And actually you can also add groups here. So instead of having uh, one per, uh, persona is actually one point in the, in the population, while a group is basically a box covering the population, part of the population. Um, so here that's what you do, selecting the measures. Uh, typically one, two, three or four measures are selected. These are your key measures that you want to use to explore the population. And then the number of personas can be added. So here you add a persona and fill in the personas, uh, persona measurements. Uh, you can also here enable statistics so you can see the percentiles. Um, and here we have the group. So the group is a basically a, a range that you define for each measurement. And then this ends up as a box in the, in the scatter plot. Um, so persona is indicated uh, with uh, a marker and uh, a group is indicated with a box. And a group can correspond to, for example, a size. Um, and what we standard uh, do is that this box uh, immediately gets one mannequin associated with it, namely the middle, the center of the box. But you are able to add more mannequins um, at the edges of the box so that you can get uh, a better idea of uh, the variation of the body shape within the size. Um, so that's what's told here. Uh, a box can have several mannequins, which are minimum, average, or maximum along the different measures. Um, it also shows the population coverage here. And then if you complete the data in the uh, measurement panel, then the, uh, the mannequins will be generated. And you also see the names here. Uh, and for group mannequins, you see here that um, for each of the 
measurements. Uh, in this case, it is average, um, but you can yeah you can uh, adjust this uh, so that it becomes, uh, for example, a mannequin uh, at the lower left corner or the upper right corner. So this is our um, scatter plot that is basically used to explore the population uh, by looking at the data from different um, angles, different um, from different measurements. Um, so we can identify correlations and while defining the uh, personas, you can also see where in the population you want to have the personas and what part of the population you want to explore with the 3D uh, view. Uh, of course, yeah, we also provide some summary statistics um, with this um, scatter plot. Um, and then the 3D um, visualization uh, is it's a live visualization in the sense that you can rotate it, you can uh, look uh, at the mannequins from different angles. Uh, and as I said before, here you can add mannequins to a specific group. For example, here we have min, average and max mannequins added to group two here. So you get the two corners and the center uh, as a mannequin. And this is interesting um, because then you can explore the variation uh, within a size. Of course, you can uh, save your analysis for later reference um, in the analysis panel. And then, um, um, of course, the story doesn't stop here. It actually begins here. So once you created these mannequins, you want to do, you want to include them in your design process, either as STL files to yeah, model in, in CAD software uh, product around, or you want to um, 3D print these mannequins or manufacture a physical uh, version of them in some way um, to do physical tests or for the, for um, for demonstration purposes. So yeah, with the download, you can download the data table, so basically the measurements that you used, uh, the, the scatter plot and the 3D models. Uh, here you see the result uh, of the different uh, models that are immediately downloaded, uh, and then you can visualize them in, in various software packages. Uh, this is an example application um, where I yeah, just want to demonstrate uh, the usefulness of our tool. So I created uh, with our uh, Caesar database, uh, with our DNet mannequin uh, platform, I created the P5, P50 and P95 heads. Um, and I did this by taking P5, P50 and P95 measures for head width and uh, face length um, and head circumference. So I used a number of key dimensions uh, and I yeah, created a small, medium and a large size. And then I wanted to see how well um, this uh, FFP2 mask, um, it's a Chinese mask, um, or at least it was um, from a Chinese uh, seller. Um, and what we did is we, yeah, we basically disassembled it uh, and uh, then put it on a flatbed scanner uh, and reverse engineered um, in that way the uh, pattern of the uh, mask um, and then also modeled some elastic bands um, and then yeah, if you do this in the the flow virtual fashion software that we already saw in some of the previous parts of this tutorial um, and you assign some material properties to the elastic band and to the, um, the material of the mask uh, then you can simulate the behavior of the mask on top of the face and here you can see that it, uh, yeah, it, it provides a different fit for the three different sizes. Of, uh, so it's a single mask size, but three different size um, mannequins. Um, yeah, and here you can see it is likely uh, too large. And here it is likely too, too small. As you can see, it, it doesn't fit over the chin. Um, of course, you can also 3D print these mannequins and then use these 3D printed mannequins in, in more physical uh, and, and tactile hands-on um, uh, evaluations. This is another example where, well, I basically uh, gave an assignment to, to some of my students to uh, yeah, come up with a product uh, that they had some affinity with um, and try to um, design uh, one size or, or a few sizes uh, using uh, of the product using the DNF mannequins. Um, so this was a soft pal, um, a protective device, uh, some uh, oxygenation masks, um, uh, glasses and, and, and goggles. 
So yeah, thanks. Um, that was the part uh, about DNet Mannequin, um, our latest addition to the DNet platform. Um, so keep an eye on it. We're continuously extending this platform uh, to get yeah, more and more data sets on this. Also, if you have data yourself that you want to share there, um, we can do this uh, with your affiliation and, and uh, appropriate references to papers. Um, so yeah, we are looking forward to uh, how this platform will be used uh, in the future and how it will evolve. Thanks. The next part will be about 4D anthropometry. It will also be the last part of this tutorial. Hi, welcome. Welcome to our final part of today's tutorial. Um, and we are concluding the tutorial with 4D anthropometry. So we had 1D, 2D traditional anthropometry. Then we looked at the theory of 3D anthropometry. And then we introduced you to some yeah, tools that you can use yourself um, to do 3D anthropometry studies. Um, and most notably our newest uh, platform, DNet Mannequin. And now we're looking a bit into the future, uh, which is about 4D anthropometry. So 4D stands for 3D plus motion. So it's basically um, analyzing people in motion. Um, and I think that you can look at uh, 4D anthropometry and modeling of motion in a, in a number of ways. Um, and the first way is through um, articulating 3D mannequins. Um, a second way, which I will talk about um, a little bit later, is um, by actual 4D scanning. Um, so then you're scanning the actual body in motion instead of animating um, a scan. Um, but I think animating a scan can also be very useful. Um, and uh, here is a, an example. Um, uh, combination of our DNet platform that we use to generate, in this case, a small and a large subject um, or body shape. And we combine it with a tool called Mixamo. And Mixamo is a tool from Autodesk, I believe. It's a, it's a, uh, a, it's a free tool that you can use. And you can upload uh, a 3D mannequin and then uh, the, the Mixamo tool rigs uh, and skins the mannequin so that you can articulate it afterwards. They also have a database of motions that you can use, um, but you do not have to use necessarily their motions. You can also apply your own motions that you model in um, animation software or that you record through uh, uh, motion tracking suits. Um, and this is what it looks like. So you just upload the mannequin, uh, rig it, skin it, uh, mostly automatically, and then apply motion to it. And here we have the same motion applied to the two mannequins that were uh, obtained from the, the DNet mannequin platform. Um, so yeah, this motion in itself, it's just for demonstration purposes. Um, it looks kind, kind of realistic, but it, it's probably not a very useful um, motion. Um, but yeah, you can apply more useful motions like uh, trying to reach certain controls in the cockpit um, or, as we will see in our next application, um, swimsuit or wetsuit motions. Um, so, yeah, we used our DNet platform together with um, a 4D rigging, skinning, and animating, uh, animation approach to optimize, uh, to design and optimize a wetsuit uh, for motion. Um, so what, yeah, what was our approach here? So first of all, we identified within our Dutch population the subjects that had the appropriate body type uh, for, for surfing. And we used that subset uh, as the starting point. And then in that subset, we started to create uh, different wetsuit sizes. And uh, a, a number of them are shown here, going from extra small to extra large. And we, um, we then took the medium size mannequin that was generated with the DNet platform. Um, and we then started designing a wetsuit around this mannequin. Uh, so that's what's shown here uh, with our, again, with the, the Claw virtual fashion software. Uh, we load our DNet mannequin in there, and then we can draw the different wetsuit uh, panels on top of this 3D mannequin. 
and then unfold and flatten it onto the plane to get the pattern. Uh, so these will be the neoprene uh, pat uh, patches that together will form the, the wetsuit. Now we supplied material properties of the neoprene uh, based on tensile tests. Um, and we input this all into the software and then you can calculate uh, the stretching of the suit um, uh, for your specific mannequin. And you can see here that some regions are, um, are stretched um, and others are less stretched. Um, and, if, and there is some desirable stretching that you want to uh, um, obtain. For example, around the ankles, you want it to be quite tight so that there is no water coming in. Um, and then this was the resulting physical prototype. Uh, and this was de designed by a student uh, in just a few months without any prior experience. Uh, so this shows that um, just with a virtual approach, you can create uh, fairly quickly uh, using uh, 3D anthropom anthropometric knowledge, you can fairly quickly create uh, well-fitting products. Of course, this is not the final prototype. You still need to do some revisions with, uh, with actual users. Um, but yeah, it's a very good starting point. And it will definitely reduce the number of iterations uh, if you would not have had access to this data. Um, so what we also did is look at motion. Um, so we have a, a, a motion tracking suit in our lab. Uh, we use that to record different motions. Um, so here you can see an example motion. This is um, yeah, basically standing up and then sitting down on the, on the surfboard and pedaling uh, towards the wave. Um, and this is one of the typical surfing motions. And um, we created also um, a set of uh, yeah, about four different motions, uh, which are typical for uh, for wave surfing, uh, sitting motion, the pedaling motion, uh, the duck dive, and uh, uh, the stance motion. Um, and we use these different motions that we captured with the motion tracking suit uh, to optimize uh, the design of the wetsuit. And here you can see uh, the result of uh, the pedaling and the duck dive motion, um, and what the effect of this motion is on the stretching of the wetsuit. And then it is up to the designer to judge whether this is within um, acceptable ranges. And if it is not, you can give some additional material in some parts of the, of the wetsuit. Or you can play around with the, uh, with the seams um, of the, uh, the pattern seams uh, because they, they have different um, behavior. Um, and sometimes yeah, playing around with, those, with the location of these seams can uh, improve the wetsuit, uh, for example, in terms of uh, crumpling. Um, so what we saw in the previous slides was uh, a, a, a body model that was articulated with computer graphics techniques. Um, but of course, that is not necessarily uh, accurate, um, especially taking the complicated uh, soft tissue and bone structure of the human body. Um, there is likely to be some, some deviations. Nevertheless, it is uh, often very good to look at this motion, even when it is a simulated motion. Um, but we think that yeah, uh, it can, in some cases, also be worthwhile to look at the actual deformation of the body when you have uh, some motion going on. Um, and for that, you need specific hardware, um, basically a 4D scanning facility. Um, and we have at our lab um, a scanning facility that can capture full body scans at uh, 10 frames per second. And here you can see an example. And you can see the uh, nice deformation of the soft tissue uh, of the upper body while moving the uh, arm around. Um, <clears throat> but this is yeah mostly... Uh, what we aim to do with the Dynet platform is to um, also have these kinds of motions, so typical motions, um, uh, available as, as, uh, as, as digital human models, um, so that you can also use those in product designs. Um, and then a final example. Uh, this is 
a bit of a yeah, different kind of example because it doesn't use digital modeling, but it just uses 3D scanning. Um, but it's a nice example to show. And this was the human power team. Um, and they were also yeah, designing uh, with motion. The human power team, um, basically uh, they're a team to create um, a bicycle uh, that is powered by human power. Um, and they aim to drive uh, or ride the bike as fast as possible. So the bike needs to be, um, yeah, it needs to be very aerody aerodynamic. The rider needs to be in very good shape. Um, and it also needs to be uh, an ergonomic cockpit. And that's where uh, our 3D scanning facility came in. So this is one of the riders. Um, and of course, you want the volume of this bike to be as small as possible. So you have the least air resistance. Um, and, and you can use 3D scanning to figure out what the smallest volume is. Uh, so she was pedaling in this setup within the 3D scanner, a 4D scanner. And then um, she was making a number of cycles, pedaling cycles. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we scanned at 10 hertz and overlaid these different uh, 3D scans on top of each other. Um, and this gives you an idea of the volume that this rider takes when pedaling or cycling. Um, and you can use this information to minimize or determine the minimum volume uh, of your uh, bike. So this was the result. Uh, this is yeah, how it kind of looks within the bike. And this is then one, one, uh, one specific uh, posture within the bike. So here you yeah, specifically optimize the bike for the rider um, and you try to balance um, yeah, the volume and the uh, uh, the shape so that it becomes as aerodynamic as possible. So that kind of concludes uh, my tutorial session here. Um, so I hope there was something that you that you learned um, or you gain some interest in this area um, and, and, and yeah, that you will start uh, to engage with this um, material and, and, and with other work out there. Um, and yeah, so I hope to talk to you later during this conference um, or get in touch with me. So please uh, do so if you have an interest in any of these materials and you want to collaborate or you want to have a discussion. Uh, feel free to contact me. Um, also, if you have a specific project that you're working on and you could use some kind of assistance in terms of data analysis or, or usage of our platforms, so please do contact me. Um, and of course, this, is, um, this was a tutorial about 1D, 2D, 3D and 4D anthropometry, but it was also revolving around our Dynet platform. Um, and this Dynet platform, it is not a static thing. It is con continuously evolving. So we are hoping that this uh, yeah, continues to evolve uh, in the coming years, that we will be able to add more and more tools, um, more and more databases, so that it, uh, yeah, it, and, and, and that the community, its community keeps on growing. We currently have about um, 18,000 uh, registered users. Um, and yeah, we want to engage more with our uh, user group. And that is why we recently also introduced our uh, forum. So we now have a discussion forum. Um, you can reach it from the website here. Uh, the last tool is called forum. Um, and there you can ask all kinds of questions uh, or, or share your experiences. Uh, so there's a specific section for questions about all the different tools that are on the Dynet website questions about data sets, uh, um, uh, pro yeah, for example, feature requests uh, or stories, uh, user stories. Maybe you have used Dynet in the past and you want to share what benefit it had for you or, or why it wasn't beneficial for you. Please feel free to do that. Um, and, and, yeah, in, and in that way, together, create a knowledge and, and data hub for anthropometry. Uh, so really looking forward to that. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'm afraid it took a little bit longer than two hours, but hopefully you 
think was the worth it. Thanks a lot.